Uh, they had some sweet rides out there. I mean, there were some cool cars. So, and here's, a, here's one of the ones. Anybody know about a 2000, I think it was a 2002 Viper. Does anyone know what's under the hood? A V10. A V10. Something like 400 cubic centimeters. I mean, this thing is powerful, right? And, he, and, and this thing was all shiny and beautiful and all. And he lifts the hood. And it's just, it, it felt like it was that big. A V10 means it's got five cylinders on each side. Now, I know that's not an even number. Well, at least not on each side. But V10, beautiful, sweet car. Fill up. Remember when you used to draw the Viper? Yeah, my son's here this morning, by the way. And so, um, yeah, Viper was one of his favorite vehicles. And this is a V10. I mean, powerful looking. In fact, some of the other cars, here's an interesting one. There was a car that came down. It was a rad, it was a rad right? And, and guess what? It was fueled by wood. Yes. No, I'm really serious. There was this like stove pot in the back of this sort of truck thing, and, and it also has some gas too, but they burned wood in there, and that's how they fueled this vehicle. It was cool. Okay, there are some old roadsters that were there, and, so, and some of them, I was surprised by the number of vet engines, and I'm like, okay, if that were a boat, you know, it would not be able to keep up with the engine, right? I mean, vet engines in some of these old cars and all, just amazing amazing things as you walked around and, and you had to look under the hood to see what is there. Now my question is what's under your hood? What's under your what's under your hood? And I'm not talking about your Subaru, okay? Or or whatever else, Jeep, whatever you're driving. Uh, what's under the hood that you have hidden in your power source, if you will, in the place where what really makes you who you are, what really makes you tick, in the place that you live out of, all right? Folks, if you guys don't have heart, you're going to really die on running that hill out there, aren't you? <laughs> Okay, and, and, and for the rest of you, you need to go out and run from Camp Pivica down to my house and back to Camp Pivica. Then you'll finally understand what I'm talking about. Diana's saying, no way. <laughs> by the way, Diana's closer to, to, to that run, so make sure you give that big hurrah or something like that so she can hear you. Dave's up there so he can hear you because they're a block closer than I am when you're running by Lover, up Lover's Lane. Anyways, you all need to do this because you need to find out what it's like and the pain that they get to go through, yeah, right? Th that you enjoy, right? You must enjoy it because otherwise you're crazy. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just sorry, just uh, stating, stating a fact here. Okay, so this morning, the question for you is what's under your hood? What's under your spiritual hood, if you will? What's in your heart that's guiding you? And what might be in your heart that needs to be taken out and renovated? Okay, maybe you got an old engine that's full of sludge and stuff and dirty, like this one car that the guy renovated. Couldn't believe it. I mean, this thing, this thing had been underwater, I'm sure. It had it, been sitting in mud, and he restored this beautiful Ford. Paint job, everything was sweet. The engine in there, everything. The wiring, I mean, this was just, just amazing. Okay, some of us need to have that kind of a renovation <laughs> under our hoods. So with that in mind, uh, we're going to look at Mark, the seventh chapter. We're going to, uh, uh-oh. I left my Bible on there, on the desk in there. <laughs> Should just do it from memory, right? In Mark, the seventh chapter, and, and incidentally, we are continuing a series on uh, any of them will work. Uh, I'll figure it out. <laughs> it's a new English version, but it'll, it'll work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Becky. Um, we're in a series in what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. A disciple is a learner. A disciple is one who has radically turned their life over to Jesus Christ to become like Jesus Christ. Uh, in fact, a disciple is really a lot like a person training for military. 
Academy. A person who's learning to devote themselves fully to a cause. And in this case, the cause is to live for Jesus Christ the rest of our lives. And as we're going through that series, this week we've just picked up in the middle kind of, of a story where Jesus had the disciples get criticized by the Pharisees. The Pharisees criticized the disciples because they did not do the ceremonial cleansing that you're supposed to do. Incidentally, if you don't know what that meant, that did not mean washing your hands before a meal. Okay, Ceremonial cleansing, you may have to do it several times during a meal as well as prior to the meal, or coming home from a market. Anytime you thought you might have been around anything unclean, you had to go through ceremonial cleansing. Now, that might have been after you've already scrubbed and everything else, but the ceremonial cleansing, you had to pour water a couple, three times on each hand and all. You had to use your fist in there. You had to dry it a certain way. And then you did the Shema Israel. You dry your hands then, because you didn't do the Shema while you're drying your hands. And you, you, the Shema Israel, hero Israel, or God is one God. And you're doing the blessing of God. You finish the Shema Israel, and then you go and you eat the matzah. Incidentally, in the middle of this, you're not eat, talking at all. You eat the matzah bread, which might be rather large. You finish that. You do the Shema Israel again, and then finally you can talk. And you had to do all this ceremonially several times during a meal if you were going to, in their mind, honor God. <laughs> In our text this morning, we're going to find that Jesus comes up with something really different. It's, in fact, this may be the one single most incredible statement that he makes in the Gospel of Mark, and really in most of the Gospels. He is going to dramatically and intentionally change what has been tradition for the people of Israel for centuries. And in fact, people have actually died for these traditions. You might remember that there were those... Uh, uh, unholy kings who forced Jews to eat pig. Okay, pig's bad. It's dirty, unclean. A good Jew doesn't eat pork, not even bacon. In fact, they don't sell bacon in the Holy Land. Did you know that? Go to Israel. They don't, they don't give you bacon there, okay? And the, and the pigs, remember the pigs with the thousands of demons that got cast into them? Those were pigs that foreigners were running, okay? They weren't Jews. And, and so if you, eat, you, you, don't, you don't eat pig, okay? This is one of those things that, that, that's dirty and all. Well, and there's all kinds of other rules and regulations. Some of you might remember last week that I said that there were in the Midrash, which was written down finally 200 years after Jesus Christ, the Midrash is a book of all the regulations that the scribes used to memorize. In one section of that book, they talk about the cleaning of pots and pans. Kathy Jo, where'd you, Kathy Jo, I'm sorry, but um, y there's going to be a lot more ritual if we're going to go back there, okay, <laughs> to getting this stuff clean, because they had 30 chapters in the Midrash, 30 chapters, not 30 verses, not 30 pages, 30 chapters describing all the stuff you had to do to ceremonially clean all the pots and pans. Whoa. And Jesus, in almost one fell swoop, is going to say, the rituals that you've been doing to keep things clean, stop it. It doesn't matter. There's only one thing matters, and it's what's under your hood. It's what's in your heart. Mark, the seventh chapter. Let's see what it says, beginning at verse 14. Uh, this is the uh, new, the English Standard Version, so it may be a little different than what some of you um, have this morning. And then it goes like this. <clears throat> And he called the people to him again, and he said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do any of you have a version there where it says, are you so dull? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Does anyone have the version that says, are you that stupid? <laughs> okay, we'll just check in because that's actually the meaning of the word. <laughs> so, yeah, I didn't know if message or the living translation used the word stupid, but 
Okay. <laughs> yeah, just good. Just take note. <laughs> okay. Then you're also without understanding. Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him since it enters not his heart but his stomach and is expelled? Don't, don't imagine that too long, okay? <laughs> okay? Thus, he declared all foods clean. That little parentheses is an interesting comment, isn't it? Right in the middle of our text. Parentheses have some other meaning. There's some other story that goes along with it. Some of you have read in Acts 9 and 10 where Peter actually has a vision. He uh, falls asleep while he's waiting for lunch. And he's up on the top of the roof. And, and as the meal's getting ready, he's sleeping and dreaming. And God's revealing something to him. And God puts this tablecloth of food down in front of him. And it's all the unclean stuff that they're not supposed to eat as a Jew. So I'm guessing there was some, some um, seafood on there. There was probably some pork, bacon, and ham. You know, who knows? Maybe they had honey baked then. I don't know. But anyways, there's a bunch of stuff that's laid out there that, that, that Jews are not supposed to eat because it's unclean. And finally, after three messages of God saying, the angel coming to him saying, eat, whatever God makes is not unclean, so eat. Uh, and then he wakes up from this vision. He hears that there's somebody at the door, and he goes with them, immediately goes with them where? To Cornelius' house. Because the men have come, because Cornelius, a Gentile, has had a vision that he is supposed to send, they're supposed to send to Simon the Tanner's house. By the way, there's in the parentheses, isn't it? Simon the Tanner. Do you realize what tanners do? They, they take a, an animal skin. They scrape the meat off of the animal skin. They hang that skin up and let that what's left on there dry out so that then they can use that skin for making clothing and things. Do you remember one of the things that made you unclean? Touching blood, touching dead things, right? What's a tanner doing? Touching blood and dead things. <laughs> and Peter's staying at Simon the Tanner's house. And Cornelius, revealed in a dream, is told, send some guys to Simon the Tanner's house. You'll find Peter there. Bring him back to you. Peter has the dream about everything is clean that God makes. He goes with the guys. He goes into the Gentiles' house. He actually sits down with the Gentiles. He actually eats with the Gentiles. Oh, boy, he's unclean, isn't he? He's done really bad stuff, really bad stuff in the eyes of the law of a Jew. And Peter shares Christ with him. And here's the amazing thing is this dirty Gentile becomes a believer in Jesus Christ and is washed clean white as snow and is welcomed into the family of God just like any good Jew was welcomed in. Amazing. Because Peter's gotten the message that what God makes is not unclean. There's the parentheses. Now back to the text. <laughs> and he said, <clears throat> what comes out of a person is what defiles him, for from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. <clears throat> For those of you who don't remember or maybe haven't heard this, the Gospel of Mark, we believe, is an, a recounting that Peter the Apostle gives to him. Mark is also the one known as John Mark. Mark is the one who went on the missionary with, journey with Paul and decided that he didn't want to stay on that journey and went back home. Later, Barnabas, who is his uncle, says, hey, I want to take Mark with us again on another trip. Paul says, N not with me, he's not going. I'm not taking that scared coward along anywhere where we're going because we're going to go face tough times. And Barnabas, the son of encouragement, 
call the apostle of God, have an argument that splits them up, and he will go, Bar Barnabas will take John Mark, and they will go off on a mission, missionary journey, and Paul will take Silas, and they will go off on a separate missionary journey. But Bar excuse me, John Mark is also that young man who later in life, Paul says, please send Mark to me. I need him. And he's a blessing to me. So not only will Barnabas again believe in John Mark, but Paul himself will also treasure this young man. And Peter will recount for John Mark the stories and experiences that he had as he walked with Jesus for three years. So as we're listening to Mark, we're getting a story and a storyline from Peter that he personally had experienced, and he's remembering things, and that's why that little parenthesis, isn't it? Because as, as, as Peter's telling him stuff, he's like, oh man, and, and while this was happening, I realized, in fact, as, we're, as I look back on it now, what Jesus was going to tell me later in that dream and when I went to Cornelius' house and all this whole other storyline comes in, but it's so far ahead that he can't really bring it up. So all he can say is, you know, Jesus was telling us everything God makes is clean. The parentheses is just huge for Peter because of what he personally has, has learned. I have another question for you this morning. Can you hear Jesus? Can you hear when Jesus speaks to you? It's interesting because in our text, Jesus has been speaking to the Pharisees. He gets away from them, and now he starts talking to the crowd, doesn't he? And he calls the crowd together. He calls them around him, and he has this discussion with them in which he knows that they've heard this context of hand-washing and, and how important hand-washing and all the ceremonies and the rituals are to a good Pharisee, to a good Jew. And what does he say? He says, look, folks. <laughs> Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. Your ceremonies don't matter anymore. You don't need to do the ceremonies. The stuff you fought for for centuries, you, don't, you, you need to stop doing that. You need to be more concerned about what's in your heart and how you're living. Matthew 5, 27 says, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. <coughs> sometimes our actions testify to what's inside our heart, right? But sometimes our, our, what's inside our heart is hidden. Our thoughts, Jesus says, is what troubles him the most. Our thoughts inside our heart is where the impurity resides. For the Pharisees, their actions hid what was in their heart. Oh yeah, they were ceremonially spotless. But in their hearts, they were full of sin. So, are you able to hear Jesus when he says to you, there's something in your heart that needs cleaning. <laughs> I stopped in the middle of the reading of the text for, to ask you, what does your scripture say? And the NIV says, are you so dull that you don't understand? Now one could say, are you that boring, disciples, that you don't get it? I, I wasn't even telling you a parable. I'm being really just straightforward with you. What goes into the body, and by the way, he, 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 clarify this here, okay? He's not saying, okay, oh, if you take drugs, okay, that's going into the body, so that's okay. You know, smoke the tobacco, it's not going to bother you, right? You know, the alcohol or whatever else. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, if you eat, the food that you eat doesn't make you unclean. It's unclean when it comes out, but that's the rest of it. He says, but the food doesn't make you unclean. Here's what makes you unclean. What makes you unclean is what you're thinking in here. It's what's going on inside you. And that comes out in a different way, doesn't it? And sometimes and too often that's kept hidden so others don't know it. He says, uh, and he says to the disciples, because they say, Jesus, you know what, man? We don't get it. What were you saying back there to the crowd? 
What did that parable mean? And this is one of those few times, and I think that the interpreters change the word here, and they use a word that's dull. Are you so dull? How, how, how did the uh, English standard say it? Are you without understanding? I'm sorry. The word that's in there is, are you that stupid? <laughs> Guys, are you that dumb that you don't get it that what these Pharisees have been saying, what you've been thinking is important is what you look like on the outside and what I've been trying to tell you is what really matters is what's in your heart. He's just had a conversation with them and he said, look guys, we fed the 5,000. Don't you remember that? It was only a couple days earlier. He walks out on the water. They're scared thinking he's a ghost. He gets into the boat and he says, you guys don't get it. You are so hard-hearted that you don't understand what I'm doing. By the way, if you want to test me on that, look at the first part of Mark 7. And that's where Jesus speaks to the disciples and he says, you guys are hard-hearted. Excuse me, I'm supposed to be pointing at the other Christians. You guys are, you guys are hard-hearted. <laughs> there, you're off the hook. Feel better? Okay, we'll see what the Spirit does later. <laughs> Folks, isn't sin stupid? Isn't sin stupid? It's enticing. We think we enjoy it. We think we want more when we get enticed by it. But it's stupid. Ultimately destroys us. Ultimately it will send us to hell. Ultimately it ruins us. Whatever it might be. Sin is stupid. And Jesus is saying, are you guys that dull? Do you not understand? You guys, it's stupid. What's in your heart? To the disciples, he is working at the heart as trying to help them to grow and become like him. And so Jesus looks at our hearts. And maybe what we need to say is, yeah, Jesus, yeah, Jesus, we're stupid. By the way, for the person who hasn't sinned, you're welcome to leave. Because <laughs> this, this message is not for you. <laughs> you got it made, okay? You, you, you're perfect. You don't fit in with us. But what Jesus understands is that in our hearts are spots and stuff that's in trouble. And sin is stupid. And it wants to destroy us. Another question. I apologize. Today, it just seemed like I had to have asked questions. And maybe I'm supposed to be asking them to me. So you all just listen to what God's been asking me. And he asked me, are, are you offended? Are you offended when Jesus points out sin? Well, I, I, I know a lot of people get offended when Christians point out sin, right? You know, we're in a tough time, aren't we? We're in, we're in one of those seasons where you're going to lose either way. <laughs> you, you really are, okay? When the Supreme Court said it's ruling about marriage and said that marriage is open-ended to anybody, incidentally, just keep watching because it's going to get broader. <laughs> you, you, can't, you can't say it's no longer man and woman without also then getting to be, okay, it's, it's man-man, it's woman-woman, it's dog-woman, it's dog-man. I mean, I'm, seriously, it's coming, okay? There's going to be all kinds of things. You can't, you can't take control of that, say it doesn't matter, and then think it's going to stay in one little framework. And so we're in, a, we're in a bad place, aren't we? Because here's the tough thing. If I told you murder was sin, would you get upset at me? Don't think so. I hope not. If I told you committing adultery was sin, would you get upset at me? I hope not. Unless you're committing adultery, then you want it to be okay. Right? And then you do murder. So, okay, God, please kill that person so I can go ahead and have this one. And everyone thinks it's all right. Right? I mean, seriously, you, if you think about it, part of what adultery is is also murder because you want that other person to be gone, so now you're going to have this other person, this new person. Okay? It's interesting how the sins start kind of linking together. Okay, but if I told you that homosexuality was a sin, now what? 
But we're in a culture where we're starting to try to say, oh, no, it's not. And, and you Christians who try to point out that something is a sin, you're just judgmental. You're just mean-spirited. You're just critical. And here's the sad thing. If you know something is harmful so, for somebody and you love them, shouldn't you speak up? about to walk out into the road and a car is coming and they're talking and drinking their coffee and they're distracted or they're texting and walking, okay, and they don't notice the truck coming and they start to step out and you love that person, what are you going to do? Oh no, if you love them, what our culture says is that you just kind of ignore it and let it happen, right? You know, if you really love them, you may actually jump out there, risk your own life, like the little girl whose uncle one day, shoved her down on the ground. 20 years later, she was talking with her mom. She says, I, you know, I just, I don't like that uncle. Frankly, mom, I hate him. He was mean to me. What, what, what are you talking about, honey? You don't remember when I was nine years old? He ran out and threw me to the ground. Oh, honey, you don't remember that there was a truck barreling down the road. He ran out and grabbed you and almost got run over because he was keeping you from getting hit by that truck. Sin is a tough thing, isn't it? Because if you, if you say anything about sin, it, it may actually appear that you're being judgmental. Are, are you offended when Jesus says, this is sin? By the way, this is one of those times he's talking to the crowd and then he gets really in detail with his disciples. Matthew 15, verse 12, some, the comparative passage says, then the disciples came to him and asked, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this? <laughs> Maybe that's why he said, are you stupid? <laughs> of course I know the Pharisees were offended. <laughs> why do you think I said it? Right? Right? <laughs> Well, don't you see? Here's Jesus' response. Parallel passage to Mark 7. Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body, but the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these defile them. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, <laughs> murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander, these are what defile a person. But eating with unwashed, ceremonially unwashed hands, that doesn't defile you. So what's under your hood? What's in your heart? Let me go over that again. Jesus said, what comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality. I grew up in the love times in which you know, everything was okay, right? Peace, love, no war. Sexual immorality of all kinds, folks. For those who say that the church is a one sin, you know, judgmental group of people, that's not true. All sin, all sin is harmful to us and separates us from God, breaks his heart and wounds us. Theft. Taking something that's not yours. What do they say? White crime is probably the biggest crime there is going on right now, and it's all about what people take from the office that doesn't belong to them. Theft. Jesus said, render to Caesar what is Caesar, and to God what is God's, and he took the money to do that. And how many Christians steal on their income tax? <coughs> Murder. No, wait a second, didn't Jesus say if you thought it in your heart, you've already done it? How many of you are driving down the road and wish something bad happened to that car that just cuffed you off? Of course, you want it to the car, not to the person inside, because you love them. <laughs> Adultery. 
Whoop. Now, with the privilege of pornography that is available on the internet, girls have as much porn, porn available to them as guys have available to them. And guess what? Everybody's committing adultery, aren't we? By what we think. Because Jesus says, look, if you committed it here, if you thought about what you wanted to do with him or her here, what did you do? You did it. You've committed the sin. Oh, my uh, are you offended that Jesus is talking about sin? Because here's the tough thing is the world is. The world doesn't want to hear. And guess what? If you're sinning right now and I pick your sin, you might get offended too this morning, huh? If there's something in your heart that you know that's wrong and you want to hang on to it, it'll probably offend you. Greed. Greed, uh, you know, isn't that just about trying to get rich? The American dream? Be successful, do well, at least have the bills paid. <laughs> Malice, thinking negative of others, deceit, <laughs> any form of dishonesty, lewdness, that's again about our physical behavior with others, envy, wanting what others have. It's, uh, it's the coveting. In fact, if you really look close at the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, what will you find? They line up a lot with the very words that Jesus is using here, don't they? Slander. Incidentally, that is the word for, that we translate in other places when talking about God as blaspheming. To slander a person or to slander God. To slander God is blasphemy. Arrogance, oh great. No one here thinks that they're wonderful, right? and folly. If we haven't covered it with all the rest of the stuff, the final one is, you know, any kind of foolish, sinful behavior, Jesus says, is in your heart, and that's making you unclean. And he then says, all these evils come from inside, and they defile a person. These are the things that render a person unclean. Psalm 24 says, Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has what? And this is where they got it from. The one who has clean hands. And the Pharisees got stuck there. And the psalmist went on to say, And a pure heart. who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. Matthew 13, 15 says, For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and get this promise, and I would heal them. What is the other side of sin? The other side of sin is when you repent, you confess, you turn, and what does Jesus promise? Isn't this good? I will heal them. I will heal you. And I woke up having just come out of having an angiogram and three stents put in my heart. And the doctor had said just two days earlier, you get to have a bypass, only he didn't say it that way. You need to have a bypass right away if you don't. Are you serious? Dog? I said I'm serious. In fact, this is so bad you might die. You go home, you sit, you do nothing until we get you into the hospital in the morning. Wow, okay. Okay, guess we'll take this one seriously. And while they're working on, on the stints in the heart, doctor said, you know, oh, Bill, you kind of kept uh, stopping. You kind of stopped breathing multiple times while you're in there. He was serious. But on the other side was what? So I came, I'm laying there in the bed the next day and I said, Dr. Nizal, you said I have to have bypass surgery. Have any of you seen a person with bypass surgery? Okay, they take a saw, literally a saw. They cut right down here. Then they have this big pry bar kind of a thing and they just pull the chest up and like this, okay? Then they go in and work on the heart. Okay, once you're done with all that, remember, okay, once you're done with all that, then they wire that chest back together. That really doesn't feel good. And they stitch you all back up with usually metal stitches too. And now you get to recover. And I'm like, I really don't want to have bypass surgery. Dr. Nizal, you said I was going to have to have bypass surgery. He says, 
So am I? Is it, oh, no. You had an excellent cardiologist, and you're not going to need bypass surgery. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> okay, but, but look at this. What comes on the other side of a clogged up heart? Of sin that's inside there that you've been denying and rejecting and not admitting? What comes on the other side when you admit it, when you face it, when you deal with it? What comes on the other side? Jesus says, I will heal you. That's what comes on the other side. What are people missing who say, oh no, we can't tell people about sin. What are we causing them to miss? Healing. Do you get it? When we're unwilling to point people towards Jesus, when we're unwilling to say something might be sinful in their life and it's bad for them, we are actually participating in them not getting healed. Maybe we need to love people a little bit more. So how do you clean? <laughs> how do you clean what's under your hood? You Got to get a whole new engine, don't you? Yeah, you hold a brand new engine. Or you're going to have to do a lot of work getting all that sludge out of the inside there. And you're going to have to do more than just a little oil change and more than just a filter change. It's going to take a radical cleansing all through. And here's what Ezekiel 36, verse 25 says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you'll be careful to observe my ordinances. That's what happens to the person who says, okay, God, I'm ready to be honest with you. I'm dirty. I got junk in here. I need you to clean it up. I got homework for you today. Read 1 Peter. 1, 2, and 3. Read what Peter says Excuse me, I just told you the wrong one. Switch it. It's Second Peter. Okay? Now we'll see who's listening. Second Peter. Read chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3. Chapter 1 says his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. Chapter 2 says, but these people blaspheme, they slander in matters they do not understand. They're like unreasoning animals, creatures of instinct, born only to be caught and destroyed, and like animals, they too will perish. Whoa, Peter's kind of a nasty guy, isn't he? He almost sounds like Jesus talking about sin. They will be paid back with harm for the harm they have done. Their idea of pleasure is to carouse in broad daylight. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their pleasures while they feast with you. With eyes full of adultery, they never stop sinning. They seduce the unstable. They are experts in greed and a cursed brood. Whoa. Chapter 3. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to what? Repentance. Verse 11, since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live, you ought to live holy and godly lives. Verse 14, so then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. I guess the best way to conclude is turn, and Jesus will heal you. Turn, it's a simple way of saying repent. Change the direction you're going. Admit the stuff that's in your heart. Turn, and Jesus will heal you. And we're coming to the table.